All right, so I'm going to talk on something a little bit different than most of uh, what you've heard tonight. So we've had a lot of uh, speakers talking about the ways we've eked out performance from our data centers, the way we've uh, packed more uh, onto the, uh, the computing resources that we have. Um, we do that too, but we do it in the cloud. Uh, given the, the nature of the talk so far, are there people here who write software in AWS? Okay, good. So this isn't gonna be totally uh, uh, foreign to everybody. Okay, so uh, I'm the manager. My name is David Hager of a team called TCDC, or Twitter Cloud Data Center. Our goal is to provide an environment in Amazon that looks and feels like a Twitter data center. And that means not just uh, you know, the machines are running the same OS, that uh, Aurora is available, but also things like uh, the presentation you just saw on Heron. We want Heron to be available. We want Manhattan to be available, our, our uh, durable key value store. We want all of the great solutions that Twitter engineers have built over the last few years to be available in AWS. Um, why do we want this? I'm gonna skip a little bit of uh, the information here about uh, what Telepart did. I came from Telepart. We were acquired about a year, well, a little less than a year ago. Um, but there are a couple of takeaways that I think are important for why we run uh, infrastructure like we run. And the big one is we were an ad tech company. Um, there are a lot of ads shown on the internet at any particular moment. And we get uh, a couple hundred thousand QPS uh, uh, around those ads. Uh, and in addition, the web pages those ads are on, everybody wants us to load fast. So we have to respond in way less than 100 milliseconds or we lose out on the opportunity to show an ad. So high QPS, low latency, those are the, the, the key takeaways. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a couple of different things. Um, the first one is a, a real benefit we got from moving to Aurora. Uh, the second one is a big change that we had to make to make Aurora work for us in AWS. And a third thing, uh, what's the future? What are we doing? Okay, so, um, our old deploy system, before we had Aurora, it was uh, not awesome. I mean, it worked pretty well. It was all fab file based. Uh, if you don't know what those are, they're Python scripts that basically allow you to run commands on boxes. Uh, it could take us an hour to deploy a, a single cluster. Uh, it could take 15 minutes just to get a single canary up and running with test code. That's a long time. Um, and if you do this a couple of times a day, it adds up. Aurora, one of the reasons that we moved to it, in addition to things like service discovery, which we really wanted, um, in addition to being able to pack uh, resources more efficiently, one of the things that we really wanted out of this was the ability to have a standard deploy methodology and something that worked quickly. So, um, hopefully I did this right. I was, I was a math major in school, so I'll be embarrassed if I, if I didn't. But you could say that the, uh, the savings if we deploy twice a day and then the deploys go from an hour to five minutes, uh, it could be you know, 476 hours a year or 25% of a full-time engineer. But really, that's not, that's not the right answer. Um, this is the model that a lot of people have for how engineering works. It's a, a set of gears all working together to turn a larger gear. And what do those gears look like? In people's minds, it's, hey, I do a design, I write some code, maybe I write unit tests, maybe I write unit tests and then I write code, but whatever the process is, there's a fixed process, I go through it, my gear turns, all the other people on my team, they do the same thing and that big gear in the back, it starts to turn. That's great, but it's not real. This is what software development looks like. <laughs> it's a bunch of dead ends, there might be loops in here if you're unlucky, uh, wrong turns. We know what the goal is, we don't know how to get there. It's hard. So when you make a deploy go from being an hour to, do it to down to five minutes or even one minute or less, what you're really doing is you're, uh, you're increasing your ability to test hypotheses. You can move much faster. And so I'm gonna talk about one particular instance of this, one, uh, one really specific use case. In the ad tech world, everything's an auction. We bid on an ad. And so we have a, a system called the bidder, creative. Um, but it, uh, in our old system, we had to deploy code and configuration together, so we had these hour-long deploy cycles. 
With Aurora and with a rewrite to our configuration system, we were able to decouple these things and actually configuration changes got down to the point where we could deploy them in less than a minute. We also uh, had a very old Python application, a little bit crufty, uh, had gone through five years of rapid startup speed development. Um, and it had originally been pretty fast, but by the time I joined, our QPS was really low per server. I mean, we were talking you know, less than 100 requests per second per server. And when you have a couple hundred thousand requests per second on your overall system, that's a big system. Um, and it didn't really need to be. Um, so we, we decided to rewrite this. And we did this for a couple of different reasons. One, we wanted to move to a service-oriented architecture away from monolithic architecture. Uh, so that was one reason. Another was we wanted better performance. Um, and so we spent six months and we did, we rewrote it in Java and this was pre-Aurora. And we got about 10x better performance. Um, well, after Aurora, uh, so I, I'm a fan of mechanical sympathy, vanilla Java, a bunch of the uh, performance blogs on Java on the internet. So even though we got this 10x improvement, I was not super happy with this. I thought we could do better. Uh, luckily, one of the senior engineers in, uh, I don't think he could make it tonight, but uh, really uh, one, of our, one of our really great leaders on the team um, spent four hours, uh, did a bunch of different tuning deploys, trying different size thread pools, trying a uh, different number of uh, jobs per instance, trying a bunch of different things. In that four hours, he was able to get a 4x increase in QPS on top of the 10x that we'd already received. Now, Actually, I'm going to say one more thing about this because I want to go back to the original question of what, is the, what do you get when you reduce that deploy time? If you think about how long that would have taken him, if he did 120 deploys in that 240 minutes, which talking to him, it sounds like is about what he did, and you said, okay, that was going to take half an hour, best case, for him to do that, 120 deploys at half an hour each, 60 hours of one of our best engineers sitting and watching deploys. That's over a week. It wouldn't have happened. So Aurora didn't just speed things up. It allowed us to do things we could not have done. OK. Um, another, so that was one of the benefits we got from Aurora, and we knew we were going to get it. Uh, something different, something that we uh, had to fix, because Aurora is, was designed for this data center environment. And it wasn't designed to necessarily run in the cloud. We're not the only people running in the cloud, but that wasn't the primary use case. So Telepart before Aurora, we um, used a lot of auto scalers. We used a lot of custom scaling logic. And our clusters would grow and shrink throughout the day. Once we switched to Aurora, that went away. Um, and so as the holidays approached, uh, we had a pretty high bar to meet. In 2014, we lost less than 0.1% of revenue due to any uh, incident, whether it was caused by us, whether it was caused by partners like Amazon or partners like DoubleClick, we didn't lose a whole lot of money. Um, and 2015 is rolling around, and we've got this new way of uh, managing our clusters with Aurora. Uh, we've started to put auto scaling back in, uh, largely for price reasons, um, but as we turned out, it, there were uh, some very good other reasons to do it. Um, one of the things we do, because the holidays are a big deal for us, we're tied to the retail cycle, just like you know, our customers are Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, et cetera. Um, they make a lot of money in the holidays. We work off of a rev share basis, so we make a lot of money in the holidays. Uh, one of the things that we test every year is we go through and we say, hey, what happens if an Amazon region fails? What happens if the Eastern region fails? We have to fail over traffic to the West, and we run that test. Uh, we build a checklist. We said, hey, here are all the systems that we have to scale. We uh, sat down a bunch of engineers in a war room. We went through it. We used DNS. We shifted the traffic over to the western region. Everything was great. That was like October 24th or something. Um, I remember this because one week later on uh, November 1st, uh, I woke up at about 3 in the morning. Uh, there were pages going off, lots of people on Slack channels messaging back and forth furiously saying, stuff is broken. Um, it, this was all in the eastern region in Amazon, and it wasn't that Amazon actually broke. There was a network partition for about five minutes, and our Zookeeper cluster was unfortunately partitioned. And even though Zookeeper is designed to stay up and withstand network partitions, it didn't. 
And so uh, all of our instances fell out of service discovery, and all of a sudden we had 100,000 QPS coming in and being routed to dev null because no, none of the servers were up. Um, this was bad, and it was three in the morning, so we kind of hastily said, hey, let's fail over to US West. We just did this a week ago. We're awesome at this. Everything will be great. Uh, and we shifted the traffic over to US West, and everything broke because we didn't go through our you know, 20 step manual checklist on what services to scale because it was three in the morning and we hadn't had our coffee yet. Um, <laughs> so we, in a fluster, we moved the traffic back, rebroke US East because now that region was, was totally messed up. And then we kind of said, okay guys, like, let's get our, you know, we've had our coffee at this point. We said, okay, we know what we're doing. We scaled things appropriately, shifted traffic to the West and it worked. Um, but we were down for like six hours and half of our traffic got lost during that period. So that um, really wasn't awesome. And it was, you know, especially going into the holidays was a little bit worrisome. So we did a post-mortem and one of the things we discovered was the only services that stayed up were the ones that we'd built auto-scaling back into. And this is something we had to um, add back in on top of Aurora. And, but once we did it, uh, the story has a good outcome because 2014, we were at 0.1% revenue loss through the holidays. 2015, we were at 0.01% and a uh, corresponding drop in real dollars. Okay, so that's, uh, that was one of the big changes that we made. And for the last part of my presentation, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about where we're going. Um, one of my team's goals really is to build this environment that makes it seamless for people to deploy to AWS from Twitter. Uh, from Twitter source repositories. We want Twitter developers to be able to make a choice, where does my code go? And sometimes that choice should be AWS. Um, but it doesn't look like AWS today. There are a lot of teams that use it. Uh, everybody has their own special Snowflake install on AWS. There's no leveraged uh, platform. Um, there's, there's very little in common. There is something um, that I should say, which is that there are very good reasons not to use AWS too, and cost is one of those. Um, everybody who's been speaking tonight has talked about um, the different hoops we've gone through to make our data centers efficient, and they really have. Um, and speaking as somebody who's used AWS for a long time and really enjoys it, uh, our data centers are impressively cost efficient. But that's not always everything, right? We wanna be international. I talked before about our latency, and, and the reason I talked about that, our latency requirements, is we wanna be able to serve ads in Asia. We wanna be able to serve ads in Europe. And if you have 100 milliseconds as a requirement, you can't do that from a US-based data center. There's just no way. Also, sometimes cost is less important than speed. And as good as our data center is and as excellent as our, our teams have gotten at provisioning hardware, there are times if you ask for a 5,000 uh, 5, servers, you can't get it the next day. Uh, somebody's gotta go rack those, somebody's gotta go uh, hook up the networking, run Puppet, all of that stuff. Um, Amazon, it's an API call away. So what have we done so far? We've built an environment that is connected via Direct Connect to Twitter data centers. We run Puppet in it uh, similarly, although not the same way that we run it in our physical data centers. We also um, have replicated a lot of the security and, uh, and user control mechanisms. Um, one of the big concerns that uh, groups like Audit and Compliance have is, hey, if somebody leaves Twitter, does their access go away? Well, because we're using LDAP, the same LDAP that we use in our data centers, yes, their access goes away. Um, we also have found ways to uh, distribute secrets, so you need to have server-to-server -server authentication. We can distribute secrets the same way that it's uh, done in Twitter. The backends are a little bit different. We take advantage of DynamoDB, but the secret distribution mechanism looks and feels similar to what it would look like in a Twitter data center. Um, we're working, at, so that's all kind of t like base level stuff. We've got an Aurora cluster. Um, we're working on next, uh, a set of next level things. So we need key value stores, we need Manhattan, we need uh, our twin cache, we need all of these things that uh, we have in a data center, we need them in AWS, so that's current work uh, that's ongoing. Uh, some of this stuff actually we've done, so unified logging and metrics, we have pipes back to our existing Twitter metric systems already. Uh, but this is, this is ongoing work that we're building this stuff out. And that gets us to parity, right? Once we have all of the same services, it starts to look and feel like the same thing. And I think uh, everybody on my team, who a bunch of them are here tonight, probably know that that's not, uh, that's not good enough. I don't wanna just be at parity, I wanna take advantage of the things that AWS does better. And I wanna make sure that, hey, at the end of this year, AWS is gonna have five regions in the US, well, 
in North America. One of those is in Canada, right? So what can we do with that? Those are spot, there are spot markets in each of those regions. There's multiple availability zones in each of those regions. What can we do with disaster recovery? What can we do with failover? What can we do to make more resilient applications when you have that much computing power? And with, that, and with all those spot markets at a very, very reasonable price. So that's one thing. International, uh, we're launching a first international region, or we're hoping to do that in uh, this coming quarter, Q2. And uh, finally, I want to get back into Autoscan, but I want to do it with spot uh, instances again. At Telepart, we saved so much money by using spot instances heavily. I believe we can, given the amount of spot instances out there, I believe we can architect an application that has four nines, five nines, some very large amount of reliability and availability. And I think we can do it on spot instances. So I want to bring back auto scaling, but with spot, uh, so that we can start to say, hey, our cluster at any particular point in time, maybe we've got 20% reserved instances, 80% spot, and we are, uh, we're able to take advantage of the fact that a lot of our traffic and a lot of our workloads are cyclical by, uh, with the, the combination of those two things. That's it. Uh,